Before proceeding, please make sure to subscribe to Angel Maniac and turn on the bell icon for upcoming videos. You can always support my work with your likes, comments and shares. For latest updates, you can join me on Facebook and Instagram at Dental Mania. For images and transcripts, please visit my Patreon page, the link for which is given here above. So, let's begin. Have you ever wondered why your mouth starts watering when you smell, think of or look at that delicious pizza you have just ordered in a restaurant? Well, this is all thanks to our salivary glands. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Maryam presenting you a series of videos on anatomy, histology and physiology of salivary glands. In today's video, which is the very first one, we'll talk about the anatomy and functions of salivary glands in detail. So, let's get started. Salivary glands, as the name suggests, are the exocrine glands which produce saliva. The human salivary glands produce about 1 to 1.5 liter of saliva per day. Saliva contains 99.5% of water and the rest of it is composed of electrolytes, mucus, glycoproteins, enzymes and antibacterial compounds. Humans have mainly two types of salivary glands. These are the major and minor salivary glands. The major salivary glands, as the name suggests, are the largest and most important salivary glands and above all, they produce most of the saliva in our mouth. That's why the focus of these video series will be the major salivary glands. The major salivary glands is divided into the parotid, submandibular and the sublingual glands. Let's talk about the anatomy of each one of them in detail. The three major and paired salivary glands as said before are the parotid, the submandibular and the sublingual glands shown here in this diagram. The parotid gland is the largest of all three glands. They are located anterior and inferior to the ears. It produces 25 to 30 percent of the total amount of saliva. The gland wraps around the ramus of the mandible in such a way that it divides into a superficial and a deep part. Both of the superficial and deep parts of the gland can be observed from this superior cross sectional view. The superficial portion of the parotid gland is located subcutaneously and anterior to the ear, while its deeper portion lies behind the ramus of the mandible. The gland is pierced by the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. This nerve lies in between the superficial and deep lobes of the gland. Stenson's duct, which is the only excretory duct of the parotid gland, runs forward across the masseter muscle, reaches the anterior border of the masseter muscle, and enters the oral cavity at a papilla opposite the maxillary second molar. The parotid gland releases its saliva into the oral cavity via the Stenson's duct. The submandibular or submaxillary gland is about the size of a walnut and is located at the angle of the mandible. This gland produces 60 to 70 percent of the total amount of saliva. The gland is located at the posterior part of the floor of the mouth, wraps around the posterior border of the mylohyoid muscle. And this wrapping around the mylohyoid muscle can be observed more clearly in this posterior view of the mandible and the mylohyoid only. Just like the parotid gland, we can see here that the submandibular gland also possess two lobes, the superficial and the deep lobes. The deep lobe lies inferior to the mylohyoid muscle, while the superficial lobe, as seen here, lies just above the mylohyoid muscle. Walton's or submandibular duct, which is the excretory duct of the submandibular gland, runs forward above the mylohyoid muscle and opens into the mouth beneath the tongue at the sublingual caruncle. The sublingual caruncle lies lateral to the lingual frenum. The sublingual gland is the smallest of the major salivary glands. 
it produces 7 to 8 percent of the total amount of saliva. The gland is located at the anterior part of the floor of the mouth in between the mucosa and the mylohyoid muscle. This gland secretes its secretions through a series of small ducts called the ducts of Rivenus. Ducts of Rivenus often unite to form Bartholin's duct, and the Bartholin's duct opens into the submandibular caruncle along with the submandibular or Wharton's duct of the submandibular gland. The blood supply of salivary glands is done by branches of external carotid arteries. Coming to the innervation of the glands, the nerve fibers which innervates these glands are preganglionic and postganglionic fibers. For the submandibular and sublingual glands, the preganglionic fibers come from the superior salivary nucleus in the form of Calda tympani nerve, a branch of the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve. Calda tympani runs forward and synapses in the submandibular ganglion and innervates these two glands through the postganglionic fibers through the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The preganglionic fibers for the parotid gland come from the inferior salivary nucleus in the medulla in the form of the lesser petrosal nerve, a branch of the ninth cranial nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve. Lesser petrosal nerve as it moves forward synapses in the otic ganglion and then innervates the parotid gland through the postganglionic fibers of the auriculotemporal nerve, a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Let's now end this video with the functions of salivary glands. Salivary glands produce saliva and saliva has got so many functions in the oral cavity the most important of which is the protection of the oral cavity. Its fluid nature clears the oral cavity by washing away the non-adherent bacteria and other debris from the oral tissues. Saliva also produces lubrication of tissues in the mouth, making it easy for us to slide tissues over one another during speech, eating and swallowing functions. The bicarbonate and to some extent phosphate ions in saliva provide a buffering action that helps to protect the teeth from demineralization caused by bacterial acids produced during sugar metabolism. Salivary proteins can bind to the surfaces of the teeth and oral mucosa forming a thin film called the salivary pellicle. Some proteins of the salivary pellicle can bind to calcium and help to protect the tooth surface. However, some other proteins of the pellicle provide a suitable binding site for oral bacteria, which causes the initial attachment for organisms that form dental plaque. Saliva is supersaturated with calcium and phosphate ions. The high concentration of calcium and phosphate results in further maturation of tooth enamel, thus increasing hardness and most importantly, resistance to demineralization caused by cariogenic bacteria. Saliva contains mucins and a variety of proteins with antimicrobial actions. Examples of such proteins are lysozymes, lactoferrin, peroxidase, and many more. IgA, which is a major salivary immunoglobulin or antibody, is also secreted in the saliva. This antibody causes agglutination of specific microorganisms, preventing their adherence to oral tissues. Saliva possess some growth factors. These growth factors help in tissue growth and differentiation, wound healing, and other beneficial effects. Enzymes such as amylase and lipase present in the saliva begin the digestive process of sugars and fats in the oral cavity. And the moistening and lubricative properties of saliva also allow the formation and swallowing of a food bolus. Lastly, saliva functions in taste by solubilizing food substances so that they can be sensed by taste receptors located in taste buds of the tongue. 
So this was all about the functions and anatomy of salivary gland. In the next part of this video, we'll talk about the histology of these glands in detail. So please don't forget to give a thumbs up and share the video ahead. For upcoming videos, please do subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell icon to get notifications on upcoming videos. Thank you for watching.